The Fallout series is, uh, it's pretty cool. Big fan, generally. Even if Fallout 76 was Fallout 76. Generally speaking, though, yeah. Uh, good stuff. I could talk about how Fallout 4 was a bit of a disappointment, which it was, not denying that. Is that really you? It's me. It's really me. Oh my god! But, I still thought it was... Eh, it was alright. Bit of a departure from Fallout 3 and New Vegas in a lot of ways, but that's not what this video is about. I don't really care about that. It's been done hundreds of times. Now, what was still fun about Fallout 4 was the aesthetic. Yeah, you still got that atomic age nostalgia. You got mini nukes. <laughs> What's not to like? A bit far from its roots of simultaneously mocking the overconsumptive, dehumanizing spirit of mid century Americana, as well as exploring the persistence of the human spirit even in the face of Armageddon, and instead just kind of become a parody of itself. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it seems, uh, kind of cool <laughs> if you look at it in a kind of ironic way. You know, hell yeah! Armageddon? I hardly know him. Genuine dread in the face of nuclear tests, you know? Massive geopolitical conflict, essentially ending the human race. Two silent flashes, far away, in the middle of the night. A momentary blip in reality for onlookers on the shores of the cold, black Indian Ocean on the 22nd of September, 1979. Imagine seeing that just without context. What would you take it for? Aliens? A freak dash of lightning in an otherwise calm sky? Academics in the years following this double flash had their own name for it. The Vela Incident. On account of its detection by the Vela Hotel group of American nuclear test detection satellites. To the public, its origins remain classified to this day, although nuclear scholars are generally in consensus that it was indeed a nuclear test conducted by the apartheid governments of South Africa and Israel. Nukes are fascinating to me. Morbidly fascinating. I find myself looking at nuclear test compilations from time to time looking at that first-person simulation of witnessing the test at Bikini Atoll, it's beyond my comprehension. I think it's beyond anyone's comprehension. The game DEFCON probably comes closest to simulating what nuclear war would actually be like, what it would feel like, what it would mean for humanity, since it takes place in some hidden nuclear missile command station. DEFCON isn't about managing resources or growing your population or managing the politics of your country or even talking to another person. It's about hitting buttons, you know? In the event of nuclear war, I mean, yeah, that's that's all anything, everything would boil down to. Huge, incomprehensible numbers of casualties pop up as you play the game, informing you of just how many lives you're snuffing up by pressing those buttons. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. How the hell did we ever get to this point where superpowers just trade visions of apocalypse with one another for geopolitical points? It's insane. Like, the, the entire Cold War era is insane. The fact that we still have nukes is insane. But I'm not getting into that. A true deep dive into the labyrinthine politics of the Cold War era is just outside of my wheelhouse. I only bring it up to illustrate that for a great deal of the Earth's population, the collective fate of human civilization has been out of our hands for as long as anyone can remember. A nuclear bomb is biblical. It's a device that has functionally granted us as a species the potential to split the sky in two with hellfire over what? What could be worth that? But I mean, do we as humans really have that? I don't think we do, not really. Because the Vela incident to this day remains classified. That's a nuclear test off the coast of a massively populated continent that has remained clandestine to this day. No governments have in any way fessed up to it. The governments toying with that kind of power don't have to fess up to anything. Doesn't matter how many times they play God. Think about how insane a nuclear test is, despite how normalized it's become in the public consciousness. In 1979, a clandestine operation succeeded over the Indian Ocean to do that, and no one with power has the care to even be honest about it, even to this day. Why are we okay with that? 
I don't know if we, culturally, as people, as, as human beings, have the skills to be good at coming to terms with Apocalypse. We can't stop trying, though. I mean, look at the Fallout series, look at all the post-apocalyptic media. Over the course of 2022, I think I saw World War III or Apocalypse trend like five separate times on Twitter because of the war in Ukraine, because of a bunch of other things. It's almost hypochondriac of us, you know, just looking for any sign that it's finally kicking off. In many ways, our preoccupation with Apocalypse can be read as seeking out catharsis in the face of constant tension. Because all this tension, all these world events, it can't just be for nothing, right? Where will you be when the atomic bombs fall? So far, it has been, though. You'd think we'd learn. Maybe we have. I mean, look at the shift in tone in the Fallout series. It used to treat the old world as this fundamentally impossible to access other world. The only relics of it dilapidated, scarred, converted into something else entirely, something new, something completely different from the old. And this aspect in the Fallout series has a very important function. It shows that our collective actions have consequences, that even if Apocalypse isn't as complete as we fear, it's real. It isn't some momentary barrier that we can traverse narratively whenever we'd like. Fallout 4 is so reticent to embrace that idea, that theme, that its protagonist is someone who just kind of survives the apocalypse. And Fallout 76 is about having fun, fun online Rust clone experience literally during the apocalypse. Bethesda has neutered the apocalypse, basically, yeah. Clearly, partly, it's because they're not great storytellers, to be honest. But I'd argue it's more than just that. The modern condition involves constant anxiety that we're living in the end times, and this fear has only become more and more reinforced with every passing geopolitical shift, Twitter trending topic, or every new statistic of every animal in the world slowly dying of Bitcoin-induced heat stroke, and we're overstimulated by it. The end of the world is no longer novel. In the 90s, when the Fallout series began, the cultural context was of relative stability, or at least of the insistence that, you know, we're good. It's the end of history or, or whatever the fuck. Hard to think about now, but yeah, if you were gaming in the Clinton years, you were doing so from a fundamentally less anxious place compared to where we are today as a culture. If things are perceived to be going generally okay, it's easier to explore worse things without it being depressing as shit to the point of emotional exhaustion for the audience. It makes complete sense that the Fallout series has become more of a parody of itself and its writing has suffered because we're too fucking scared about everything to get into the darkness of Apocalypse in a quote unquote fun video game. You can do it, yeah, but not without it being a bit more awkward than it would be if World War III didn't occasionally trend on Twitter. We can't engage with it because it feels too real. Yeah, nuclear apocalypse is a threat. It's always been a threat for as long as nukes have been around. We can't discount that. However, there's also, well, <sighs> yeah, the uh, slow apocalypse of, of climate change. It's kind of hard to avoid that. Climate change is almost a uniquely difficult, apocalypse-coded scenario to wrap our minds around, because there isn't really a singular, violent event that wipes everyone out equally. It's a multifaceted, complex problem that can't be as easily understood to be bad as nuclear war, because it does a lot of different bad things to us that coalesce into a worldwide crisis, which affects different populations separately and to different extents. Worse than that, it's slow. There's not really a climax there. Where's the catharsis, you know? It's not great for a narrative. A conventional apocalypse would almost be better for our brains. At least we could wrap our minds around it more easily. Maybe that's why there's been so much apocalypse media over the last decade or so. It's just on our minds all the time, but we have no way of dealing with it. We've all got apocalypse blue balls. Don't Look Up is an interesting artifact of existential anxiety for that exact reason. If you haven't seen it, spoilers for Don't Look Up. It's about Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, both asteroid scientists, trying and failing to get the relevant authorities to mobilize against an extinction-level comet headed directly for Earth that they spotted. Here's the spoiler, they fail 
everyone dies. I liked it. That's not the point though. I'm not trying to review the movie. Obviously a meteor the size of Mount Everest hitting the earth sucks for anyone living on it. And the way it presents the moment of impact is in my opinion, the uh, most effective part of the movie. What's interesting though, is that the tragedy of humanity failing to prevent its extinction despite people knowing the basics mirrors the tragedy of the writers themselves, David Sirota and Adam McKay. After the film's release, they were so fucking annoying on Twitter and how they were utterly insistent that their movie about what if rock hit earth would be a crucial catalyst in getting real world audiences to care about the real potential of apocalypse through climate change. But that hasn't happened obviously, and I don't mean to gloat about that, obviously I'm not cheering for climate change, but you can't escape the looming threat of apocalypse through one okay movie. You can't overcome social causes of mass death by waking people up to it. Dude, everybody is already awake. That's not the problem. The movie is even about this, basically. The powers that be are kept in place by systems which favor greed above all else, so why wouldn't they continue to act on that greed? Adam McKay and David Sirota seem to believe that Don't Look Up is an effective activist project not just a movie. The funny thing is, though, that its narrative basically disproves that idea in and of itself. Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence can't stop the meteor, no matter how much media creation they participate in. Don't Look Up is basically that in real life. Adam McKay and David Sirota didn't really fucking change anything by making the movie, aside from making the movie, I guess. At the end of the day, Don't Look Up presents a vision of apocalypse that we can't escape. Institutions are categorically opposed to actually doing anything to stop the end of the world because it's just too profitable. Its answer to all of this, you know, the climate apocalypse, just the general state of melancholy that we all have every day, it's, uh, it's basically just going, damn, that sucks, fuck. Shit, we're gonna- oh fuck, we're all gonna die, Oh man, we can't even- we, we- we can't even do anything about it, no matter how much TV we get on. Fuck. It's muddled and weird and self-defeating. Your typical narrative relies on some kind of catharsis, and since Apocalypse Media taps into real-world fears, of which there is a perpetual tension, no catharsis, since world has not blown up, you run the risk of simplifying the topic to the point of absurdity, as is the case in Fallout. Alternatively, you can try to be as holistic as possible, tackle the topic head-on, hoping to make some actual headway in real life, but then, as is the case in Don't Look Up, the paradox of making media about dealing with the apocalypse through media, which doesn't work, the movie is even aware of that, you just end up with a movie that eats its own tail. It's a kind of narrative Ouroboros. How do you relieve tensions of apocalypse through media then? Like, what can anyone even do about it? The answer, in my opinion, is, uh, fuck all, really. Apocalypse, uh, sucks. It would suck to happen to us. Not good. Everybody wants catharsis. Shit, I mean, think about how much easier a comet would be to wrap our minds around than climate change. To boil it down, it's like how getting killed by a rock is more understandable than being killed by, like, I don't know, cancer. Don't Look Up is trying to make some kind of big point about fighting climate change through an analogy designed to make climate change make more sense, but climate change doesn't make sense. That's a really important property of it. That's why it's so scary. No one fucking gets it. You can look at a million charts, but at the end of the day, you're looking outside and you drive to work and it makes the earth heat up and it's killing you. And society can't adapt to that. At least not in the way that it's set up. Don't Look Up just fails to make it understandable. Like, how could it possibly not fail to make it understandable? It's a, it's a toughie. It's a topic so dark that it swallows up any light shown into it, like a black hole. Can you even tell a decent story that doesn't make you feel like shit while still tackling the topic of the climate catastrophe? Is Don't Look Up really about the slow, shitty apocalypse of climate change? No, it's, uh, it's really about an alternate, easier-to-digest apocalypse. It, like any other disaster movie, is just an attempt to give the audience some kind of tragic catharsis for their daily lives. The main difference between Don't Look Up and like, I don't know, fucking Independence Day, is that it tries to convince the audience that watching it is in any way effective environmental activism. Remember when I said I liked this movie? <laughs> 
Is Fallout about the apocalypse? No, it's about the absence of apocalypse. It's about having a world-rending event and then surviving and still having quests to do and all kinds of other shit. It's really hard to make a topic like this easy enough for mass audiences to digest. In order to make themselves digestible, they basically don't talk about reality as it is. Maybe we as naked apes can't come to terms with the death of the biosphere in the same way we can't easily come to terms with our own deaths. We can't stay in that darkness for too long without it overtaking us. Because if we look too long into that darkness, we'll see that same double flash of light people saw over the Indian Ocean on the night of September 22nd, 1979.